This time on The Gadget Show. There'll be noise. <laughs> Music. <laughs> Silence. And a whole load more noise. Hit it! <laughs> As Jason and I face a music gadget challenge to find the quietest and loudest gadgets possible and to discover the best format for listening to music. John is wondering just how clean his house can get as he tests the techiest of vacuum cleaners. Tickle it, dear, tickle it. Don't beat it to death. And Otis travels to Italy to ride a rather big metal dog. Oh, look at that! Welcome to The Gadget Show. Now, take a look at these, all right? Mm. Take a look at these flappers. Aren't these the finest pair of luggles <laughs> you've seen this side of Prince Charles? <laughs> and guess what? They're going to put me in good stead for this week's challenge. It is true to say that Jason has got an advantage, because this week's challenge is all about music players. Yeah, and first up, we're getting physical in an attempt to work out which of these music players is the best to use while you get fit. Yeah, so Jason and I went head-to-head -head in our very own MP3 Triathlon. We were testing music players, specifically designed to be used while you're being sporty. We picked one player for each stage of our triathlon. The first stage was swimming. I got the new Speedo Aquabeat. It holds 240 songs and is waterproof up to three metres. And it's got these clever little ear hooks that help keep your earphones in place while you're gliding through the water like a turbo-powered dolphin. I'd gone for the Finnish Swim P3. It holds 60 songs, but the cool bit is that it uses bone conduction instead of earphones. That means that they send sound waves into your skull, which ends up in your inner ear, giving you, the theory goes, good sound when you're in the drink. Armed with two very different technologies, we stepped up to the marks to see which one would bring victory. Three, two, one, go! The first thing we had to do was to get our music playing, and I was onto a winner. The Aquabeats control system was really intuitive with ergonomic buttons. They're big, they're bold, and they're really easy to use. I wasn't having quite so much luck with my Swim P3. The controls were so small I could hardly feel them. What, Jess? I'm still fiddling. And when I did get the music going, the quality was very patchy indeed. My sound really isn't that good. It's very tinny. And as I come in and out of the water, there's a big change in the quality of the sound. Meanwhile, I was forging ahead. Come on, what are you doing? Oh, don't, don't take the mickey. I've been trying to make these things work. My thumping music was helping me get a rhythm going, and it sounded great. I really enjoy these Aquabeats. The sound is fantastic. Because you've got in ear buds, you feel completely immersed in the music. Jace made one last push, cutting across into my lane, but I was home and wet. <laughs> Susie and her easy-to-use aqua beat had won the stage, but I had a chance to get my own back in the cycling. Three, two, one, go! Aha! For the cycling leg, I've chosen the sci-fi. There's no point wearing headphones when you're on your bike. When there's stuff in your ears, you can't hear anything that's going around you. What you want are speakers, and that's exactly what this sci-fi is. The rechargeable sci-fi speaker connects wirelessly to your iPod using a dongle. Which means that I can change my tracks and volume remotely. My choice, the Soundwalk Vest, is a wearable audio system consisting of two speakers in a shoulder harness. But unlike Susie, I had to change the tracks via my MP3 player. This can be a bit fiddly, but despite that, it feels really comfortable. While I was tinkering with my controls, Susie had pulled her head, but I wasn't beaten yet. Tell you what, Susie, what? I can hear your speaker system from here. Mine's really loud. The only thing that the sci-fi would say, it is a tiny little bit tinny. The sound quality on the sound warp vest is fantastic. It may be something to do with the orientation of the speakers. They're very near my ears. It feels oddly like I've got headphones in. <laughs> Jason's confidence in his speakers had given him a burst of speed. And as I changed gears to chase him, he rounded the final corner. <laughs> hey, the finish! I can see the finish! No! Yay! With Jason and his super sound walk taking the cycling, we were neck and neck for the final race, the main event for sports MP3 players running. Three, two, one, go! 
I'd gone for the 2 gig 500 song iPod shuffle. It's really light with an impressive 12 hour battery. I don't care if you can't see which tune you're listening to. I only want to hear the music. I fancied my chances with this Amios MP3. It's just one gig of memory and a 10 hour battery, but what I loved was its total lack of wires. I think the sound quality is fantastic. Well, I think the sound quality on this is also fantastic. So far, we were pretty even, but in this test, usability was everything, and in that respect, the shuffle was brilliant. It's so easy to use, it's got the Apple wheel, so you can shuffle through tracks or change your volume very simply. Yeah, I've got to say, though, yeah? this fixes the same sort of boxes. And those functions, how easy are they to use, then? They're a lot easier than probably they look. Um, I shuffle forward and back between tracks using this little jog switch at the bottom. But now I'm suspecting that when she's asked me that question, it was more about putting me off so she could take the lead. With my MP3 keeping pace with Suzy's beloved shuffle, the last lap would come down to one thing. A sprint finish! Oh, 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 oh that's not good! Ha ha! Ha ha! No! Yes! No! You dipped! I dipped. <laughs> I dipped to the line. <laughs> But I had to. I had to give everything I got. <laughs> Good fun. I really, really was impressed by this Speedo Aquabeat. It just worked beautifully yeah. in the water. I was similarly impressed by the Soundwalk vest. I also think it's fantastic. And I'm surprised. It's not the sort of thing I would normally go for. Mm. But if you're out with a group of mates, you're mountain biking, you're walking, you're camping, whatever, it's cool. You can share your sounds. But I think you'll notice from that little bit of footage that you saw that somebody won two parts and somebody won one, which means that I am currently <sighs> leading the challenge. Yeah, but you're forgetting one thing, Suze. You okay. see, you don't have the these luxuriant listening devices <laughs> luxuriant. Like which are going to put me in first place in the next stage of the challenge mark my words going on about your ears again. oh yes girlfriend got them flaunt them <laughs> welcome back now i want to talk to you about vacuum cleaners we've all got one but i bet you've never thought of yours as a cutting edge bit of technology well, the latest machines on the market are just that, capable of turning the drudgery of housework into a satisfying tech fueled experience. In fact, since I started researching this item, I've become obsessed with keeping our home carpets clean, much to the delight of Mrs Bentley. As ever, though, which one's best? To decide that, I headed off for a dirty assignation. Armed with my chosen three, I came to a posh East Sussex hotel, where I'd secured the use of three identical suites. Very nice. But though they may look pristine now, these orangey carpets are about to get messy. I've gathered together some of the household nasties that get onto and into our carpets. There are various foodstuffs, some pet hair, and some bags of household dust. Nasty. So I set about covering the sweets with this dust and dirt, along with some nuisance bits of flour, paper and sawdust, before heading to meet my esteemed guest, TV's house cleaning expert, Kim Woodburn. Ah, hello, Kim. Oh, hello, John. I can see you're already inspecting the place thoroughly. Do you know I am? Okay. And it's in tip-top condition, so I can't find dust anywhere to... Unfortunately, I've managed to make a bit of a mess in some of the rooms, and I was rather hoping for your help vacuuming. Come on. Oh. Typical man, aren't you? Yeah. Hmm. In room number one, we had the Hoover Slalom, a bagless cleaner with 2.2 litres capacity and a flexible handle. It offers a pretty standard 200 air watts of suction and its front brush bar agitates the carpet to pick up particles deep in the pile. Tickle it, dear, tickle it. Don't beat it to death. No. Hoover's Airvolution technology claims to circulate the air through three filtration cells at forces up to 23,000 G, separating even the finest of dust particles. Oh, it's doing a good job, my love. I'm happy. But when it came to assembling the attachments, Kim and I found them just too fiddly and frustrating. Oh, God, God, I don't mind him, is it? We can't do this. This doesn't look a bit professional. <laughs> we finished off the job, then Kim got us down on our hands and knees. The true test is, you can see, but the truer test is this. If you don't see any dust rising... I can't see any dust rising. Then it's grab the internal dust. It's mm. wonderful. OK. Wow. What do you think of the Hoover overall? The pickup's great. Love the, love the roll effect. Mm. Just work on the attachments. In room two was the Electrolux Professional, a bagged cleaner with a huge 3.8 litre capacity. Good looking, isn't it? You've got mm. to give it that, haven't you? And you know, it's got 260 air watts of suction power. That's the actual suction exerted on the carpet. We should suck the carpet up itself, shouldn't we, with that? <laughs> Let's have a go. The Electrolux has a chrome steel brush roll driven by a rubber drive belt for non-slip operation, 
Plus, you can set the height of the base to suit different carpets. It certainly seems to have a powerful suck. And you can see the stuff trembling before getting sucked in. I know, my love, I know. The bags are treated with baking soda, which apparently absorbs any nasty odours, and they're simple to change. Am I doing a good job? You are slacking a bit, dear. All men slack, dear. <laughs> For hard-to-reach areas, the Electrolux can lie flat to the ground, and there's a lightweight telescopic tube which has cleverly inbuilt attachments. Can you see any dust when I'm doing that? Pay attention. No, I can't see any dust. And overall, it's very clean. However, yeah. I'm just noticing there are one or two little bits. There's a few little yeah. bits, I must say. Overall, what do you think of the electrolyte? I think it's very good indeed. I think it looks jolly robust. Mm. And I think it'll last you a long time. In room number three was the Dyson DC25, a bagless vacuum with a 1.3 litre capacity, which can twist and tilt thanks to a unique pivoting roller ball. Now, that tough polypropylene ball also houses the motor, so it keeps the centre of gravity very low, which reduces the feeling of weightiness at the handle. I just love it. The Dyson has a cyclone system for filtering out dust. They claim the sucked-up air spins at up to 80 metres a second, experiencing centrifugal forces of 150,000 G. Oh, this is very good, look. Mmm, slicing through. The one-touch method for releasing and emptying the cylinder pleased Kim. It's so flipping simple. And we both like the very intuitive set of attachments. I think it really could make your vacuuming an extra pleasure. And Kim noticed that, unlike the others, the Dyson plumped up the pile as it cleaned. I'm terribly impressed with this. We were having so much fun that we were fighting to finish off the job. I feel all woman using this. This boots a honeymoon night, you know. <laughs> and I should know, dear. And on that bombshell, it was time to get on our knees one last time. Can you see any dust? No dust. No, I think it's smashing. It's a great job, isn't it? Oh, you oh. couldn't get out of line with Kim, could you? Yeah, she has a strong sense of discipline. Right, mm. G ratings then. Three Gs for the Hoover. It picks stuff up very well, but the attachments are horribly fiddly and also it's a bit flimsy, really. OK, three mm. Gs for the Hoover. What about the Electrolux? Three Gs for the Electrolux as well. It's very well made, but it's a bit heavy and also it left a few bits behind. What about the Dyson? Kim seemed to really like that. So did I. I think it's five Gs <gasps> for the Dyson because, I mean, it's a great piece of design. It's really fun to use. It picked everything up and also it left the carpet looking and feeling so much better than the other two. Oh, luscious. So mm. the Gadget Show's favourite vacuum cleaner is the Dyson. Now, I've got something oh. here you might be interested in. I know you're a big fan of your classic Polaroids. I am, because Polaroid mm. cameras got me into photography. Well, this, is, this is their latest one. It's the Pogo Instant Digital Camera. And true to Polaroid tradition, basically, it's a camera with a printer in it. It uses their latest zinc technology, zero ink, so there's no sort of ribbons or ink Cartridges in the camera. Cartridges or anything. Basically, there are a load of crystals in the paper itself, which is in the camera. When you hit print, it comes out over a thermal print head which activates the dyes and produces the colours in your picture. Well, let's have a look. Mmm, mm, that's not yeah, bad. Not on air. Right, now it's time for the Gadget Show Wall of Fame. Each week on the Wall of Fame, we're looking at one particular area of gadgetry and then choosing the most iconic and important gadget from that category to join our Wall of Fame. Each week, Susie and I choose a gadget that we think deserves a place on the hallowed wall and the final choice is made by Judge John. Last week, I championed the iPod and look, there it is. It was the first gadget to make it onto our Wall of Fame. And this week, the question is, what's the most iconic and important video format ever? VHS or DVD? VHS, or Video Home System, just has to find its place on the Gadget Show Wall of Fame. Because it was revolutionary. Not only because it was the first format to bring home video recording to many of us, but the VHS is the gadget world's toughest street fighter. It won the most intense format war in gadget history. JVC launched VHS in 1976, a year after Sony had launched their Betamax home video cassette system. And to begin with, it didn't look good for VHS. Betamax was better quality and already had pretty much 100% share of the fledgling market. So, how could VHS get the upper hand? The very earliest Betamax tapes could only record one hour of footage, whereas the larger VHS tapes held two hours, enough to record a movie. 
VHS tapes were also cheaper. They were better marketed and, crucially, you could easily rent a VHS machine. In the UK, it's thought that around 70% of machines in homes were rented. By 1981, VHS had won about 75% share of the market and the format war was over. These tapes changed the way that we thought about home entertainment. For the first time, we could time shift our TV watching. We could own our own favourite movies and we could make our own home movies and watch them back straight away. This was the first VHS camcorder, the GRC1. You might recognise it from Back to the Future. It looks pretty big now, but VHS, it changed our lives. Lives. And for that reason alone, it should be on the Gadget Show Wall of Fame. What Susie's forgetting is that the quality of VHS was rubbish. The tapes would get chewed up, they'd jam in your machine, and if you had a collection of VHS tapes, you'd have to rent a storage depot to keep the enormous things in. As soon as the choice came along, DVD, we dropped the VHS like the brick that it is. The DVD format was the spearhead of the digital revolution due to groundbreaking cooperation across the whole technology industry. There were, in fact, two separate digital formats being developed and it looked like another format war was on the horizon. Then the big computer companies got involved, Microsoft, Apple and Dell, and they said they wouldn't put up with the whole shebang. One universal format had to be chosen. The DVD was the digital format of choice. The first DVD movie was Twister in 1996, and this was the first DVD player to be sold in the UK, the Panasonic A100. It cost £400, but was still a bestseller. By 2001, DVD ruled the world, with sales worth tens of billions of pounds. And the ways DVD can be used is incredible. It can store any and all digital information, from music and movies to photos and computer games. The DVD is a simple but effective, groundbreaking bit of tech that fully deserves its place on the wall of fame. If nothing else, it'll keep the birds away. Absolutely fascinating. Both impressive cases. But I've got a couple of questions for you both. Now, Susie, VHS, picture quality is absolutely terrible. Weren't we just sort of holding on, waiting for something better to come along? With VHS, we were just grateful that we could record programmes off the telly yeah. and watch them when we wanted to watch them. And it just yes. changed our mm. lives. That's why it should be on the Wall of Fame. Now, Jason, DVDs, a nightmare of incompatibility with all these different standards and formats, particularly with things you record yourself. What do you say to that? Oh, come on. Inexpensive, incredible quality gave birth to the, the modern video game with all of its complexity and huge file size. Mm, really yes, small yes, yes, yes. and inexpensive to make mm. and, and very versatile and that's why I think it deserves to be on the wall. This is a very difficult decision. I mean, they're both important products. I can see the picture quality of the VHS may be let down. I can see the popularity of the DVD but ooh, what's it going to be? I think it's going to be Susie's oh, yeah! VHS because it liberated more people for the first time from the TV show yeah. than anything else. And also, it was the first thing to bring Hollywood movies into your home when you wanted to watch them. And I think, for those reasons, the VHS deserves its place on the Gadget Show's Absolutely. Wall of Fame. Mwah. Welcome back. Now it's time to return to this week's challenge. And... I think that we can all remember who won the first part of this week's challenge, the MP3 triathlon. I don't remember. I have no idea, actually, who won that. I know, <laughs> I know this much, it wasn't me. But, nevertheless, I'm quite confident for this next stage of the challenge. Oh, I've yeah. got a little bit of a strategy, Susan, I think might work. Mm -hmm. It involves me just calming down a little bit, all right? Ooh. Just trying to be a little quieter than usual. Just maybe block out some of the, the noise all around me. Yeah, whereas my task is to find the lightest and noisiest gadget possible. Jason would try and find noise-blocking gadgets, but I would win if my big, bad, noisy tech could beat his defences. Now, excess noise is always a problem, especially when you're trying to talk on the phone, but I thought I'd found the solution. What you need is a Bluetooth noise-cancelling headset. This is the new Griffin Smart Talk Bluetooth. It works using two microphones, one to pick up your voice and one to pick up the background noise. It then compares them in order to filter out the unwanted noise. I like it, you know, it's small, yeah. it's lightweight, it fits comfortably onto my inordinate ear large flappers. Very good, but I think I've got something that can take on your oh-so-wonderful Bluetooth headset. The Samsung F400 contains two high-quality Bang & Olufsen speakers with a wider frequency range than usual phone speakers, which means louder sound without distortion. Now, I've got a clever idea. Why don't I play this loudly next to your phone? While I ring you up. ring John. John Bentley, OK. Let's see if he can hear you. Yeah, I've got his number. All righty. <laughs> that is really loud. Hello? See so if your two microphones can handle this bad boy. 
Gosh, is, who's that? It's Jason. Can you hear me? Um, John, where are you right now? I'm in, in East Sussex at a very splendid golf club. We're doing a thing on... Uh... I haven't a clue what you said. How would you rate uh, you hearing me from one to ten? Ten being excellent. I would say about five. Thank you very much, John. Bye. Jason's Griffin just couldn't cope with the very loud and very good quality sound from my Samsung. Right, round one to me. What else you got? I've got these, the very best in in-ear noise-cancelling headphones. The Goldring GX200s have tips made from memory foam, which expands inside your ear to create a soundproof seal. They're so effective, they're used by US military pilots to block out helicopter noise. With the music playing, with my groove on in these, I can't hear anything. I wonder whether you're going to still be able to hear your music when I switch on my iPod dock. Now, I know what you're thinking. iPod docks, not usually associated. Yes. Well. However, this is the IK500. It comes with a six-inch subwoofer and it claims to be the loudest iPod dock in the world. Play your tune, 80s boy. The kicker was handling 40 watts of sound with no distortion. I was impressed, but Jason just seemed oblivious. Are you kidding me? I didn't even know you put it on. Take those out. Let me show you how loud this is. So, one all, but my next gadget was something pretty amazing. This is the Audio Spotlight, a speaker that you can't hear unless it's pointing directly at you. It works by using ultrasound, which travels in a very narrow beam. Now, we can't hear ultrasound, but as the beam travels through the air, the air makes it change shape into audible sound waves. Now, I've plugged my microphone into the directional speaker, right. and I reckon you should just... Hold it at various angles. And just point it. Point at the people down there and let's have some fun. Hello, you in T-shirt. Can you hear me if I turn away from you? Put your hands up if you can hear me. Yes. Yeah, man. Despite being 30 feet away, my victims could hear me perfectly, but no-one else heard a peep. What number am I saying? Put it in fingers, number three. Yes, that's incredible. <laughs> Give me a wave if you can hear me. This is the voice of your conscience speaking. You've finally gone mad. I was impressed. But to beat Jason's audio spotlight, I'd need to find some tech that could be heard for miles around. You're going to have to wear these. All right, I'm ready. Hit it! This stupidly loud car belongs to Ian Iceman Pinder, holder of the UK Street Bass Record, and it packs audio gadgets with a total output of over 24,000 watts. <laughs> Ian's car system has six 15-inch Orion woofers, as well as 20 amps, 76 smaller speakers, and a cutting-edge Kenwood CD tuner. This is how loud it is, OK? All right, Ian. <laughs> Do that again. Do it again. Unbelievable. The immense pressure of the noise was actually displacing the air. Seriously, I, I don't believe I'm saying this, but you've done it again. You <laughs> So you won that part of the challenge. Oh, thank you. Hey, you know why I like that car so much, though? Because you could visually yeah. see how loud it was. Oh, it, was it was absolutely... I mean, my organs were breakdancing inside my body. The vibration <laughs> was really intense, wasn't it? It was fantastic. Now it's time for a report from the Gadget Show's latest signing. We picked him up in the Christmas transfer window and now he's a permanent fixture on the Gadget Show team. I'm, of course, talking about Otis Dealey. And we've sent him off on his first foreign assignment uh, to meet a robotic dog in Italy. Naturally. To find the dog, I needed to find its owner and creator, a chap called Lyle, who, as you can see, keeps himself busy creating weird stuff. Lyle, right. how do you do? Otis from Gadget Show. No, sure. Oh, my goodness, is it...? I mean... <laughs> yeah, that's Larry. Lyle Rowell is a self-taught welder and mechanic who makes robots out of anything he can salvage from scrapyards, and Larry One is his most recent creation. Part car, part scrap metal, part Mad Max nightmare. It's an awesome thing to look at. I expected a robot dog. <laughs> No, he's not really a dog, is he? Larry is powered by an old 2CV engine, and it was time to hear it roar. <laughs> oh, 
<laughs> Sounds gorgeous! Crazy! Instead of driving the wheels, the drive shaft is connected to the front legs, a bit like the way bicycle pedals are connected to a bike. It's just a heck of a lot more beefy. Do you mind if I jump on the back with you? Yeah, you're welcome, mate. Come yeah. on up. <laughs> I can't believe this. I'm going to hold on to you here. It's incredible. I'm riding a robotic dinosaur. OK, so how do you steer it? How do you control Larry? This thumb switch here. The left and right for the steering. Uh huh. The switch operates electro valves that cause hydraulic rams to turn the back wheels left or right. Of course, because it's rear wheel steering, left is right and right is left. The gearbox to just use first or reverse gear. First or reverse. <laughs> backwards. Scream if you want to go backwards. I've done a pub crawl in town. <laughs> on it. Took a while, but uh, oh, this red button. Yep. Only touch it. If you want to do that. Oh! <laughs> oh, look at that! Flames from the nostrils! <laughs> Gas canisters hidden under Larry's bottom feed nozzles in his nostrils and tail, so with just a flick of a switch, you get a flame grilled cameraman. So basically, this is a crazy walking bomb, which made me a little nervous about taking the controls, but that was precisely what I'd come to do. There's no kill switch, no brakes. OK, then. How many people have had the privilege of riding Larry One, apart from yourself? No one. I am honoured. <laughs> Brilliant! If you can't find it, grind it. <laughs> Here we go! Look at that! It's fantastic! I am riding the beast! With its growling engine, stomping, kicking movement, and almost organic looks, it was easy to forget that Larry One was mechanical and start to believe that this creature was alive. I think this is as close as I'll ever come to riding a triceratops. And it's all mechanics. There are no electronics making it move at all. Steer it the other way. That's it. She moves about a bit more in reverse. Sit the car with the tail. Ah. I want one of these. Wow. Really good fun. You're <laughs> up high, big, massive steps it was taking, and it breathed fire. You can't beat the fire breathing, can it you? It was really cool. Okay, I've got something similar. I think you're going to like it. No fire, though. Oh. I apologise for that. Come and check him out. Okay. His name's G Dog. Uh huh. He's got a hip hop name. I like that about him. Uh -huh. This is the next generation of servos, robotic servos. So you've, we've seen several bipedal uh, servo-based robots on this program, OK? Uh, but not ones that move this quickly or are quite as agile. Interestingly, the skeleton on this robot is also quite interesting, made of a nylon resin. So it's very resilient, but it's also lightweight and it's inexpensive. Ah, yeah. So those days of sort of aluminium, I think, are gone now. I think this is the kind of material that you're going to see being used. Look at that. Isn't it superb? A lot easier to control than the uh, big beast I was on, actually, yeah. and a lot less frightening. Right, now it's time for another top five, and this week we are looking at digital picture frames. Now, we have looked at digital picture frames a couple of times on The Gadget Show in the past, and we've always found them to be, well, to be honest, a bit rubbish. However, the best of the latest crop have improved massively, but which are best? Well, you're about to find out. Digital photo frames are a great way of showcasing all your favourite photographs, and some will even play MP3s and videos. But ultimately, it's how good your picture looks that's important, and that is how we're going to judge our top five. To test all the frames, I was going to use the same publicity photo of the four of us taken recently in the Gadget Show studio. I've chosen one of the photos from that session and loaded it onto all of our digital picture frames. And to help me choose the top five, I've enlisted the help of the Gadget Show's expert snapper, Mr John Bentley. Mm, hello. We assessed 15 photo frames in their default settings to judge the overall picture quality. Anything that looked soft, distorted or in any way unnatural was eliminated. Finally, we narrowed the field down to our top five digital photo frames. 
five. It's the Parrot Specchio, a stylish frame, but it only has a 130 millimeter display. And with this mirrored effect, John, it's a real object of beauty, isn't it? Yeah, it's very good to look at. It's like surreal there. You sort of end up looking at yourself while you're looking at a picture of something because of the mirror effect. It's got uh, Bluetooth, so you can send pictures to yep. it from a phone. It's got Wi-Fi and an IP address, so you can actually email pictures to your picture frame. At four, the Jobo PDJ 701 has a 180 millimeter LCD screen set in a brushed aluminium and clear plastic frame. I think this one's got a very good picture for the money and it's also got a relatively large internal memory, a gigabyte, which could be useful. It's also got a really good card reader, it takes ah. lots of different formats. Yes. Although I do think they could improve the styling. Number three is the Samsung SPF 105P whose large 260mm screen has the highest resolution in our top five. You have got this lovely, clear picture with the great detail mm. in the eyes there, nice skin tones. You're not green around the gills here, which is a good thing. Yeah. Uh, and it's got a touch panel on the right-hand side there. I'm not too keen on this sort of swirly carpet around there. And it's got flowers on the back. Yes, presumably that's because it's been aimed at the ladies. At two, the Digital Spectrum Solutions memory frame has a simple design and can store 5,000 photos. So it's decent size, it's got good colours, it's pretty sharp, and it's got plenty of features. It plays MP3s, you yeah. can play your videos, and it's got a remote control, so you can sit back on the sofa and change your pictures. Yeah, and if you don't like the simplicity, it actually comes with a, another photo frame that ah. you can just fit over the top, or indeed any standard 10 by 8 frame that you get in a shop. But at number one, it's the Sony DPF D100 which has superb colours and excellent contrast on its 260mm SVGA panel. Definitely the best picture of all of the frames. Sony have done away with the frippery and the gizmos that the others have got, and this is literally just a picture frame. It won't do anything else. The sort of size you'd actually want a real printed picture to be. One thing I think that could be improved, I think I'd prefer it if they didn't stick their name on the front. It's a bit bad form, really. However, at least they've been big enough to accept a whole range of different types of formats of memory cards, not just their own. And, crucially, they've also got a remote control. Crucially. Welcome back. Now it's time to return to the final part of this week's music challenge. The first part of the challenge? I, I won the first part, didn't I? No, I won the first oh, no, part, no, the MPT triathlon. You did. Well, the, the second part, that had my name on it. No, that was mine as well. Did you get that one? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Alright, well, maybe the third part, the next part, the final yeah. part, um, you know, I could maybe just pull ahead you know, Wait, I think actually I could do it. You could say face, yeah. Are you confident? Yeah, I, I'm going to go with yes, I'm, I'm, I'm confident. OK. Yeah. The third part asks one of the most important questions in the world of gadget actually, music. I'm not that confident, if I'm honest. I think you might win the next part as well. <coughs> Excuse me. What format should you buy your music on? In the world of tech, there are a multitude of different audio formats depending on which gadget you play your music on. The big three are vinyl, CD and MP3. These are the three formats that have the audio boffins arguing, the MP3Js waving their annoying little digital devices in the faces of the orchestral soloists who love the supposed warmth of that analogue vinyl. And in the middle, getting all hot and bothered, the CD fraternity waiting for the whole thing to kick off. But which format actually sounds best? We went to the Crescent Theatre in Birmingham to conduct our own blind test and find out. We're going to be listening to Money by Pink Floyd, which music aficionados will tell you is one of the greatest recordings ever made. We'll be using the 2003 remastered version of the track across all three formats. Money is an intricate multi-track recording with great sound effects, and we'll be playing each format through the same high-quality Morden Short speakers and Denon sound system. It was time to don our blindfolds and rely totally on our ears. And first up, MP3. MP3 tracks are small data files that are compressed for easy download and storage. They're measured by their bit rate. The more bits per second, the higher the quality. iTunes tracks, for example, are generally 128 kilobits. But we found a site, 7 Digital, which has 320 kilobit tracks. And that's what we went for. Remember, at this stage, we had no idea in what order the formats would be played. Oh, that takes me back. What? Oh. Don't you think you could pick out all the instruments? Yeah. Clarity is amazing. And also, th there's a position to the music, don't you think? That the, the various elements kind of sit on the stage. Grab the 
Then I stuck my fingers in my ears so that Susie could divulge her opinion in secret. Oh, that was a really great sound. Obviously, it's really difficult to judge on hearing just the first one, but I felt that the, the sound was really uh, full, uh, had a richness to it, and I'm guessing it might be the CD. It was magnificent. It was emotional. There was a real colour and depth to that. So, we were both impressed by the clear, rich quality of the MP3. But would our opinions change when we heard the CD? To make a CD, a track is sampled more than 40,000 times per second. Those samples are transformed into ones and zeros, which are represented on your CD as a series of bumps and pits in a long spiralling track. The laser in your CD player reflects back off the bumps and reads each bump as a zero and each pit as a one. If you stretched it out, it would be nearly five kilometres long. <laughs> Difficult. Again, I thought the sound was really intense. Honestly, I'm finding this really difficult now. Um, again, that was a, an amazing sound. I felt really immersed in that sound. That's either CD or vinyl, or I could have number one wrong. But I can't tell you until I've heard the third one. But Jason was less convinced. I was just left with a lack of depth, which made me feel it was the, uh, the lossy compression that MP3 is famous for. No question about it, it's MP3. Next track. So, on to the last of our formats, vinyl. Technically, vinyl should be superior as it's analogue. It stores all the information from an audio recording rather than the samples. But can the human ear actually hear that amount of detail? Money. That just put the among the pigeons for me. I thought it was a bigger sound than number two, but not as good as number one. Here we go, ready? The third one, it had a bit more shape, a little bit more sort of fruitiness to the flavour, but I was just left with a lack of emotion. For me, that sound was a lot thinner than the previous two sounds, although it was quite rounded. Actually, all three sounds have been excellent. I don't mind listening on any format. But we had to make a decision which was best. Remember, the number one was MP3, number two was the CD, and number three was vinyl. My verdict is number one had the most raw emotion for me. Number one. Ooh, number one was to die for. Amazingly, we had both chosen the MP3 as having the best sound. What an amazing result! Incredible. I don't think you could find a sound expert out there who would have predicted that result, do you? No, I don't. And, and I genuinely wanted the best sound to be vinyl, probably because I grew up with vinyl. and I've got a kind of love for it, you know. No, not you mean. But, I mean, I, I have to make one thing very clear, that the, uh, the MP3, the portable music format that we use mm. on an iPod, uh, was recorded at 320 kilobits per second, yeah. so it's the highest bit rate. But uh, nevertheless, that is commercially available and it is a shocking result. It is, isn't it? Which we drew. Which means that I win the challenge. So that means that I win this week's challenge you and you've got a chance of winning next week. <laughs> I have. There's no, always you a chance. There's always a chance. Why? Because you're not in it. Okay. That's all for this week. See you next time. See you next time. <laughs>